We're talking about miracles and how the God of the Bible is a God who can move mountains in Jesus' name. So what we're doing in this series, we're in week four, is uh, we're kind of taking a journey through the miracles of Jesus and how God supernaturally interfered with just natural events. It did things that are impossible otherwise through Jesus. So we're not just going to uh, read a bunch of narratives from the Bible and learn from these stories. We're taking this as an opportunity to also engage your faith and belief in general. We want to engage your thinking. Uh, we want to talk about skepticism. We want to talk about doubt. We want to talk about hurt. We're going to talk about all of that, as well as challenging you to take a bigger step of faith in your spiritual life and in your spiritual journey with God. So this week, what we're going to be doing, uh, this miracle of Jesus that we're going to be looking at um, is potentially the most climatic miracle of Jesus in all of the Bible. It's definitely the climatic miracle in the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at how Jesus did a miracle with his friend, Lazarus, and how he raised Lazarus from the dead. That's right. I said it. D-E-A-D. -E he was dead, and Jesus raised him back to life. But, well, Pastor Trevor, dead people stay dead. I know. That's why it's a miracle. So... Now, just a little bit of recap of where, just to catch everybody up, maybe uh, if you're new or if you haven't, uh, if you weren't with us last week, here's what we were trying to do. Um, we're trying to look at patterns in the Bible uh, from the miracles of Jesus that we can learn from, that we can apply to our lives. What we're not doing is trying to be prescriptive. Here's what I mean by that. Um, we are not reading the pages of the stories of Jesus and going, okay. So if we do A plus B plus C, that will equal a miracle, and we could get God to do what we want God to do. Like it's a formula. that If you do these three things, there's a spiritual lever that gets pulled and opens up hatch doors from heaven, and whatever miracle you want from the sky gets dropped down on you if you just do the right things. Then it will happen. God doesn't work that way. God's not a math equation. God's a person. And I don't know about you, but the notion of, well, if I do these three things, that God has to do that, God will look at you and go, I don't got to do anything. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. God's not our, I, I said this at the night, he's not our cosmic sugar daddy who just does whatever we want him to do. God desires to move in our lives, and he wants to move in our lives way more than you and I think. And so when some people think, well, A plus B plus C, then we'll make God do something. God's like, why do you think you have to make me do anything? I want to do things in the first place. He's way more relational. So we're looking at patterns, not prescriptions, patterns that we can learn from about this relational God and how he wants people to relate to him and his power at work in the world. So we've talked about the idea of boldness. That God often moves in great power when people are bold, when people are audacious. There's one passage of scripture when Jesus talks about how people should pray. He says, because of someone's shameless audacity, they got what they asked God for. And so God honors not sweet kind, gentle little prayers like, well, Lord, I don't want to pray for my life. I just pray for world peace, Lord. God doesn't honor it. God wants bold, crazy prayers. I, one of my favorite pastors one time, he said this, that um, if your prayers, oh gosh, how did he say it? Shoot, I, <laughs> I should have, uh, well, what? okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. I had prettier wording. I had it at nine and pff, it's out of my head. One of my favorite pastors says this, that, oh, I got it now. There we go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> if your prayer doesn't intimidate you, it's probably insulting to God. You catch that? If your prayer isn't intimidating to you because it's so bold, there's a good chance it might be insulting to God. Like, God's like, really? That's it? That's all you've got? You can't ask me for something bigger than that? Really? So God honors bold requests. Um, God also honors... Um, obedience. Because when often we ask God with big faith to do something huge, God will go, awesome. I want you to carry this little piece of it and take a step in faith and do what I tell you to do, no matter how crazy it might seem, because I want to see if you really mean what you say. And it's a test of faith, honesty. Um, it's a test of faith. To God see if we really mean what we're saying. And so God, um, Jesus often tells, time, tells people to do 
strange things, outrageous things, wild things. Um, I said, great, and here's your little piece of moving a mountain if you'll trust me and do what I say. And somewhere in the middle of us just doing what Jesus says to do, a miracle happens. So last week when Pastor Dale was here, he talked about the idea of desperation. And I talked about over at the East Campus, the idea of desperation and how God often works miracles in people who are desperate. But it's not just basic desperation because people who are desperate can go in all sorts of different directions. And just because you're desperate doesn't mean you're reaching out in the right direction. It has to be rightly aimed, rightly focused desperation. Not just desperate, but desperation in the right direction. Um, I'm the type of person where I believe, and I think this is true in scriptures, that it's not our circumstances that make us desperate. It's our circumstances that remind us just how much we need God in the first place. You catch that? Our circumstances don't make us desperate. Our circumstances make us remember how much we need God. And that's the prayer of desperation of God, I need you. And when we learn to do that, what do you know? God moves in mighty ways. And God just doesn't show up. God shows off. That's what we're talking about. So we're going to jump into today for a passage where Jesus shows off a little bit. And this is the story of him raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. So this comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Um, The whole story is one of the longest miracle accounts in all of the Bible. It's 44 verses long. Um, We ran out of paper. So we all, no, I'm just kidding. Come on, everybody. (laughs) There's 16 verses on your notes. That's the passage we're going to read in its entirety uh, for this section together. Um, But we're going to be referencing the story all throughout the 44 verses. You can go read it at home yourself later on. Okay, so John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Wow. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So these are some of Jesus' dearest and best friends. These are people in his inner circle. And so it's not just some random person saying, Jesus, this person is sick, who's your fan? Come help them. This is somebody who, no, Jesus, this is somebody who's your friend. And they're sick. It's implied, please come. We know what you can do. They know him. So verse four, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. That's where Bethany was. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you and yet you are going back? See, um, because of Bethany is in Judea, it was just not even half a day walk. It was a little bit of a stroll if you were walking between Bethany and Jerusalem. It's just on the outside. It's like Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem. And there are people there, religious leaders, who hated what Jesus was doing and literally wanted to kill him. Isn't it strange what sometimes how what toxic religion does? How toxic religion makes people do ungodly things in God's name? Strange, isn't it? So it's a threat to Jesus' life, literally, to go to Bethany, a stone's throw away from Jerusalem. You see what I did there? So they're trying to stone him to death. Some of you just got it. All right. So they're worried, like, Lord, you're endangering your life by going there. So Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anybody who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going to go wake him up. I just love that. That's so deeply comforting to me, that the lens that Jesus sees death through 
It's just sleep to him. He's not intimidated by it at all. Not in the least. I hope that comforts you. So our friend Lazarus, he's falling asleep, and I'm going to go wake him up. Beautiful, poetic, spiritual language. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. It's like they, they completely don't get it, those goober heads. They say, well, Lord, if he's taking a nap, I mean, he'll, uh, he'll get better, won't he? And Jesus looks at them like, oh, my gosh, these idiots. Why did I recruit these 12 guys? <laughs> oh. And so Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. They're dense. Makes me feel better. I'm a little dense. Jesus welcomes me. Thank you, Lord. So verse 14, so then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, okay? He's dead. And gosh, no, just he's dead. I'm going to go do something about it. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Now let us go to him. Gosh. Verse 16, then Thomas, oh boy, here comes doubting Thomas. Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, well, let us go also that we may die with him which is really Thomas going, great, Lazarus is dead. You're going to die going there. We all might as well just go get ourselves killed. Great, let's go. That's our passage for today. <laughs> the title of this morning's message is called Wide Awake. Wide Awake. Let's pray. So, Lord, uh, we're awake here. We're full of coffee, as Billy said, but now I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would awaken our souls. Awaken our spiritual ears and eyes and our heart to hear what you're having to say to us so that when we hear what you're saying to us in your word, it would bring a deep awakening within us beyond natural sleep. Do that now. You woke Lazarus up. Wake us up. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, this story is fascinating. It's only found in the gospel of John. It's not in any of the other Gospels, which is interesting. Uh, many of them get a lot of their source material. There's four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, ancient biographies of the life of Jesus. Um, Mark it was the first one written and provides a lot of source material for Matthew and for Luke. None of the other ones talk about this story. They focus a lot in the Israelite region of Galilee. They focus on that and almost exclusively ignore Judea. John writes about some of the stuff that Jesus did in Judea. Interestingly enough, some scholars believe that Mark did not write about this account and what happened here to protect Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Because if Jesus comes and raises you from the dead in your village, and then other people who love and follow Jesus hear about it, congratulations, your village just became Christian Disney World. <laughs> And so they think that they're trying to protect them from a million people who are trying to come and talk to them. It's fascinating. It's interesting. So um, again, we're looking at patterns, and I see a first pattern right away in our passage in John 11:4. We just read it a second ago. And it talks about this here. Jesus speaking, when he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, be for God's glory. Underline those words. God's glory. So that God's Son may be glorified. There it is again through it. Here's another pattern in miracles we're talking about. It almost always leads to God receiving glory. This should hit your brain like we've been talking about this. It's in our theme verse for this series in Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. Now to him, what does it say? And uh, to him be the Glory in the church and in Jesus Christ. There it is again. Glory. Glory. Um, see, when God does a miracle, when God supernaturally interferes with the natural working of the world, it does something that can't be reproducible in a lab. It's something that goes from outside a realm of thinking outside from the realm of what's naturally possible. When God does that, when God shows off, it brings him great glory. It says, so there may be glory in the church. I want that for us. So does the Apostle Paul when he wrote that. That if, as if God is doing immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine in our lives and in the lives of our church as a collective group of people, because remember, the church is not a building. The church is a people, and it's a movement. If God's doing it, there will be glory in 
the church, when God is showing off in all of our lives, it brings glory to him, not just in these walls, but outside these walls. One of my favorite uh, leaders in the 20th century and church world stuff is a guy named John Wimber. Anybody heard of him before? A couple of hands. John Wimber uh, was a total hippie in the 60s and 70s. I'm talking sex, drugs, and rock and roll, everything you can imagine. Don't go woot necessarily. <laughs> Somebody went, yeah! No, okay. Um, so he was... <laughs> wow. So anyway, anyway, John Wimber was total party animal, uh, totally going with the cultural norm of what was going on in the 60s and 70s and the, all of that craziness. And he had a radical, dramatic encounter with Jesus. Dramatic encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. See, most people, when they begin a relationship with Jesus, um, they're like a, a dimmer light switch that faith slowly comes on over time to where they realize that they have a spiritual awakening and they want to become a follower of Jesus. It's kind of gradual in a process. That's most people. Some, uh, that's about 80% of people, we think. About 20% are a light switch, where one day it's one thing, and then another, everything's different. It's on and off. Some people are like that. John Wimber was kind of like a circuit breaker. A bam, complete 180 degree difference. Delivered from drug addiction and crazy living, all sorts of stuff in just a moment from an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Very powerful. So he'd never been to church before, ever. Jesus just showed up in his life and started working powerfully. So he showed up to church. And what do you know? Back in the day in the 60s and 70s, it was not okay to wear jeans to church. And what do you know? In the 60s and 70s, people didn't play guitars in church. God forbid there was electricity running through your guitar in church. And so he walked in not knowing what to do with holes in his jeans and sandals and, you know, all, all this stuff and that movement. And they accepted him and loved him. But after a couple of weeks, he decided, okay, I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of this church thing. And I'm reading this Bible. It seems what's happening here is very different than what was happening while reading this book about the life of Jesus. So he goes up to the pastor afterward. He says, pastor. Hey, um, thanks for letting me come here. Um, I want to know, when do we get to start doing the stuff? <laughs> and the pastor's like, the stuff? He's like, yeah, the stuff. What do you mean? You know, like what Jesus did. Like Jesus was going around like healing people and miracles happening over the place and the apostles did too. You know, when do we start doing that? When do we start doing the stuff? And the pastor looked at him and went, oh, John. Well, I mean, uh, we don't, in this church, we don't believe that God does that stuff anymore. And we don't do this stuff in this church. And John Wimber looked at him with bewildered eyes and said, you mean I gave up drugs for this? <laughs> now, luckily, luckily, John Wimber discovered that God still does the stuff. And we're the type of church that believes that God still does the stuff. When God does the stuff, and when God shows up and shows off, it brings glory to him. That's what we're after. That's what we're after. That's right. Praise God. That's what we're after. Now, here's what I also notice. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days. What? He stayed two days? I mean, like, who does that? I mean, if you get a phone call with bad news about a loved one, this isn't like Jesus saying, wait, let me finish my sandwich and then I'll go. <laughs> Jesus waited two days before going to him. And in, in between this waiting of the messenger coming to him and Jesus waiting and then eventually going, Lazarus dies. Can you imagine how difficult this must have been to process for the disciples when he says in the front hand, this sickness will not end in death. And then Lazarus dies. Has anybody ever made a religious proclamation in your life that ended up looking like it wasn't true? It's tough to swallow. Seems out of characteristic of Jesus. And so Jesus eventually makes it to Bethany and later on in verse 21, Martha comes out of her house and leaves all the people who are at her house from the funeral still and the grieving that's going on and the pain that's going on. Martha meets him at the gate of the village and she says this in verse 21, she says, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm. 
Mary comes out later. Next. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. And this isn't necessarily a posture of worship. This is a posture of grief. She was the one who poured perfume on his feet and wept over his, and wept tears on his feet and worshiped him by wiping his feet with her hair. Now she's not worshiping, she's grieving. Broken at the feet of Jesus. It says this. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I love this passage because it's so raw and real. Because that little phrase there, if you had been here, that's the same thing that you and I say when we cry out to God and say, God, where were you? Where were you? Jesus, you're too late. If you had been here, they wouldn't have died, but you weren't. Where were you? And see, it's moments like that, like we're reading here, where people sometimes take a step towards faith, but a lot of people back away from faith and disengage with faith and lose faith because of pain like this. A really great book I would highly recommend to you guys about a lot of this is by a man named, a great pastor named John Ortberg. And he has a book called Faith and Doubt. And about halfway through his book, he gives a little paradigm for why do some people back away from faith and struggle with doubt and disengage from faith? He gives three basic reasons, of, at least for him. <coughs> and the first thing he says and some people disengage from their faith because of lack of evidence. Lack of evidence. They disengage because they don't think there's enough to believe. There's a famous story that John tells in his book about a man named Bertrand Russell. There's a picture of him on the screen. Um, he was one of the most famous atheists in the last century. And when Bertrand Russell was 90 years old, and he looks old in that picture, but when he was 90 years old, he had a famous encounter with a woman at a party, and the woman said to Mr. Russell, you are, you are not only the world's most famous atheist, you are maybe the world's oldest atheist. You will die soon. Okay, good party manners. <laughs> what will you do if after you die, it turns out that God exists? What will you do if you come face to face with this God whom you've defied your whole life long? Bertrand Russell replied to him and said, I will put my finger in his face and say, you, sir, have not supplied sufficient evidence. Oof. Some people, it's purely an intellectual thing. Some people. So that's why some people disengage from faith. Some other people disengage from faith because of so-called believers. People who claim to follow Jesus, but they don't act like it at all. I believe it was, um, I'm not sure if it was Henry Nowen. Hmm. I can't, well, I can't remember exactly who said this, but it wasn't me. They said the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then deny him with their lifestyle and go on living as if he doesn't even exist. There's some people I meet who are followers of Jesus or claim to be, and I'm like, can I give you $100 so you'll just quit saying that you follow Jesus and not make it harder on the rest of us? And then there's sometimes I'll look at myself in the mirror and be like, what am I doing? I'm living completely different than what I say. We all have moments like that, and we all struggle. So sometimes people disengage because of that. But here's the real thing and why most people disengage from their faith, and we see it in this passage. It's the problem of pain. And this is what we're seeing with Mary and Martha. It's their pain. And the question of God, where were you? That's why they back away. Um, I was at our East Campus a couple weeks ago. And it's a little bit different there. The room is much bigger. Um, and uh, 
there are more people, obviously, who attend here at West Campus. It's a growing congregation out there, but we have a long center aisle at the East Campus. If you've ever been there, it's beautiful, and you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I was preaching in our miracle series about two or three weeks ago, and as I'm getting ready to land the plane for the message, and the band is about to come out, we're about to have a moment, this woman gets up from the back and starts walking briskly down the aisle. I'm like, well, maybe she's coming to sit next to her friend, or maybe, you know, she went to the bathroom and I didn't see it in the middle of the message or whatnot. And then she keeps coming, I'm like, oh, she's coming right for me. <laughs> oh, oh, and I'm trying to talk like I did Jesus think, uh. And she looks like she's about to walk up the steps right up to on the stage. I'm like, well, I'm about to have a guest up here. This is going to get interesting. And um, this woman, instead of walking up on the stage like I thought she was about to do, threw herself down on the steps, crying out to God in the middle of the message, towards the end of the message. And so I quickly finished everything I was doing, and I can't remember if it was Keith or Billy who were leading us. They did a wonderful job leading us worship. We dismissed, and I, instead of going to the lobby and greeting people like I normally do, I just got down the steps and put my hand on her shoulder and said, hi, my name's Trevor. How can I pray for you? And we spent an hour praying together and talking. She told me her life story. And let me tell you the horrors she told me and the terrible things that she told me. It's not my story to tell, and I'm not going to. But the one thing that came up over and over and over again was, where was Jesus then? In my worst day of my life, where was he? He wasn't there. How could he have been? Lord, where were you? This passage is right on the fault line of the miraculous work of God and the tragedy of human experience all at the same time. That's what happens next. It's just stunning. Matthew eleven thirty five. 35. It's the shortest verse in the Bible if you ever go on Jeopardy. But it's this. Jesus wept. He wept. When, Mary, when Martha came to him and when Mary came to him in their grief and in their brokenness, said, Lord, where were you? What he did not do was, well, see, I waited two days because I wanted him to die so that then I could come raise him. This was happening with angels and this was happening with demons and this was happening here. And here's my plan. He didn't explain himself. Not one bit. He had a conversation but no explanation, none. And after him just being around all this pain and all this grief, Jesus, he knows what he's about to do and he still weeps with them. See, the God that's revealed in scripture and the God of Christianity, which is different than any other religion the world has ever seen, is a God who puts on human flesh, skin and bones, has a heart just like me and you and will come and sit with you in your pain and weep with you. Jesus reveals a God of compassion Amen. and a God with a heart who hurts when you hurt and weeps when you weep. There's a passage of scripture that says, your tears are so precious to God that he collects them in a bottle, not because it's a sick hobby of his, but because his heart goes out to you more than you even realize. So many people in their grief and in their loss and in their pain and in their tragedy go, why? Where were you? And they're waiting for an answer and they just hear deafening silence. Because in this book, when lots and lots of people ask God those questions, he just doesn't answer them. And it's not because he doesn't have an answer. It's just that's not his response. Every time. His response is to put his arms around you and to weep with you. And for some of you who have not heard from God in a long, long time because you've been reaching out for answers and explanations, and you feel far from God, if you would instead learn to reach out for his presence and to be touched by his compassion, the God of the Bible will meet you and weep with you. It's not about explanations, guys. 
It's about the presence of a friend who's come to be with you. You know, Jesus isn't just this soft, compassionate God who has no power. He gets up. If you read the passage, it's almost like he wipes the tears from his face. And he says, where is he? Where's the tomb? And I say, Lord, it's over there. And it says he was deeply moved. And in English, deeply moved, we think it's, oh, he's more compassionate. No, the word in Greek means he got angry and he got irate. So he wipes the tears from his face and says, where is he? Tell me where the tomb is. I said, Lord, it's over here. And he goes to the tomb. It says, deeply moved again, irate and angry. He's not angry at Mary or Martha or anybody else who's crying. He's angry at sin, at Satan, at death, at whatever disease kills Lazarus. And he hates it with all his heart and his soul. And so Jesus comes, where is the tomb? There's the tomb. Roll it away. Roll the stone away. Lord Jesus, we can't do that. It smells. He's been in there four days. Did I stutter? I told you you were going to see the glory of God. Roll it away. And they roll the stone away. And this irate God of holy love, angry at everything that we hate. He hates it what we hate too that's broken and awful in the world. The stone gets rolled away. He lifts his eyes towards his father and says, Father, I know you always hear me, but so that they know that you hear me. Lazarus, come out. And he does like a mummy wrapped up with all of his grave clothes. He does the Lazarus. He comes out. It's not the floss, you know, like he's doing the Lazarus. And he lives. Oh, man. Wow. And notice here when Lazarus came out of the tomb is different when Jesus came out of the tomb. When Lazarus came out of his tomb, resurrected from the dead, he still has his grave clothes on. When Jesus comes out of his tomb, the linens are all nice and neat and folded where he left them. Lazarus came out of the tomb, still had a mortal body that was exposed to this world and to sickness and pain. Jesus comes out with a mortal body, but it's glorified and it's different. He could appear and disappear, yet he eats fish with his disciples, but then has supernatural abilities. It's different. Lazarus comes out of the tomb and Lazarus dies again one day. Tradition says Lazarus either made it to the island of Cyprus where he died as a bishop and they built the church of St. Lazarus on top of his second tomb because his first one's empty. Or he made it to Paris and was beheaded for preaching Jesus by Emperor Domitian. And Jesus walked out of his grave never to die again. Died once for the sins of all mankind. Tasted death once and for all, for all, never to die again. Is sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now. They're different. Lazarus was the teaser trailer. Lazarus was the preview. Jesus is the real thing. Write this down. Miracles, when they happen, are the in-breaking of a coming kingdom. It's like when you're boiling a pot of water and you see the first bubbles come up. That's what miracles are. It's the inbreaking of God's kingdom that's invading this broken and dark and suffering world to make it all right again. And so we see miracles like dead raisings and healings. It's the signs of what's breaking in. And when we experience tragedy and loss, it's the uprising of a kingdom that knows it's already defeated. We have an inbreaking kingdom and an uprising one with its last dying gasps, and we're caught in between. That's what it's all about. Last thought, and the band's gonna lead us in a song. Jesus says this to Mary and Martha, or to Mar or Martha, excuse me. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me even though they die or the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The promise of the resurrection from the dead and the life everlasting, the kingdom of God, it's the greatest promise that's ever been made. It's not universal. 
It's only for those who believe and put their trust in Jesus. So his question to you today, not mine, his, to you, is do you believe? And will you take a step out to trust him? I hope so. Let's pray. So Lord, right now, I just sense that you want to do for people in this room and streaming online what you did for Mary and Martha. You're not here to give answers and explanations. You are here to draw close as the God of compassion. Would you do that now? Soften hearts to feel your presence, Lord, to people who are ready to put their questions down and to just to reach out to you in the hopes that you will reach back to them because they need you. They need your love, your compassion, and your presence. For the hurting heart now, come Holy Spirit and do just that in these final moments, I pray. Amen. So may you now go forth from this place, reach now to the God of compassion who is with you, who weeps with you, who holds you, who is with you through the miracles and through the tragedies of this life. And may you have eyes to see and ears to hear when he calls your name to come out of the grave. May you do so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. amen. Friends, before you go that way, we're going to have some prayer teams up here in the front. Be bold. Come get some prayer before you go that way. God bless you. We'll see you next week.